Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're just going to wait another moment for a few more folks to sign on. Thanks. Hi everyone, welcome to the TBR webinar series. Today, Practice Manager and Principal Analyst Patrick Heffernan, Senior Analyst Boz Ristoff, and Analyst Kevin Colfi and Kelly Lozuska will be discussing the end of digital. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. At the bottom of your screens, you'll see a series of buttons. From left to right, you can access the slides, audio controls, Q&A, speaker bios, and our survey. After the webinar, you will receive an email with a replay link, as well as a link to view and register for other TBR webinars. If you have any questions for us, please submit them in the Q&A widget in ON24. You may also reach out to us after the event at webinars at tbri.com. Thank you again for joining us, and here is Patrick to begin the webinar. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, welcome, everyone. I know this isn't the first predictions webinar in the in, from TBR this year, but uh, hopefully this is the one that will spark the most uh, conversation and discussion, and we are intending to keep it fairly limited in time. We'll try and cut it off at about 25 minutes or so, so that we can get to your questions and feel free to send them in um, as we're going along, and we'll either take them as we go or we'll, we'll save them all for the end. So I want to say, if you haven't read the, the document that this webinar is based on, I, I strongly recommend it. Um, you can find it on our website. It's the 2020 Sur Professional Services Predictions. Um, and we're going to cover today, each one of my colleagues is going to tackle one of these. We're going to talk about um, possible economic downturn and, and what some IT services vendors and, and consultancies have been doing to sort of cement their relationships with their clients that are worried about funding what those clients have been told are really necessary digital transformations. We're going to talk about a shift in the consulting world and the consulting model from people to people enhanced by products and what, what that's going to mean. And then we're going to talk about how everything is and or will be digital, and so the whole designation of digital is, is at this point obsolete. I do want to explain um, before we go to the next part um, where all of these predictions come from. Uh, we, we do sit around at the towards the end of the year. We sat around last November uh, as a team, as a full team, and talked about what we see in the marketplace and what we're expecting. And I think our predictions this year were really based on three things. One was a lot of the research we've done around 
digital transformation that, that's the portfolio led by Boz, and especially what we saw at the end of the year when we were looking at the voice of the customer research and what we were hearing both from uh, customer clients who are engaged in digital transformations with their different vendors, uh, and then also clients who are, are thinking about it. So I think that influenced our thinking quite a bit. Um, we also had some very senior level discussions with consultancies and with IT services vendors, with the executives running those companies that, especially throughout the fall of 2019, that I think influenced a lot of the way that we see what's happening uh, in the market and what we're going to be expecting. I think those those conversations definitely deeply uh, influence the way we look at what could happen uh, in the event of a, an economic slowdown or a downturn. And then, of course, the last part of it is is all of our all of us as a team, we follow the, the IT services, professional services, consulting world, but each of us as analysts look at individual companies. And so when we look at the data and we read that data and what does it tell us about what the vendor's performances had been in 2019 and what we're expecting in, in 2020. So that's where these predictions come from. But before we get to the meat of them, we do want to keep ourselves honest and talk about what did we say a year ago? What were the things that we were predicting at this time last year? about what we were going to see in 2019. And it's it's mixed re, mixed results here, to be honest. I think we nailed the first one. Um, the the companies that we tracked that, that talked about and really implemented changes around employee first, that put the emphasis on training, uh, put the emphasis on their own internal culture, I think those are the companies, we're talking about Accenture, PwC, EY, Capgemini, these are the companies that have really accelerated uh, in 2019 and did well. So I think I think we nailed that one. Um, on the second one, I think we were right about this uh, when it comes to solutions and IP. I think we just didn't see the acceleration in this area that we thought we were going to see in 2019. And I think that probably points to some challenges that still exist uh, for the consultancies. And we're actually going to get into that topic in a little bit more detail um, from Kelly. And then the last one, um, you know, we're still... We're still waiting to see this. Uh, we're still waiting to see whether this prediction is going to come true. Um, so I guess we'll have to revisit it again uh, at the start of 2021. And so with that, we're going to jump to the actual predictions themselves. And as I mentioned, uh, Kelly Baws and Kevin are each going to take one of them. So we'll start the lead off on the first one of these uh, with Kevin talking about a potential economic downturn. Kevin? Hey, thanks, Patrick. Yeah, here on uh, slide seven, this is our first prediction. And uh, it's a market correction or recession here will stall digital transformations and slow growth for IT services vendors and consultancies. Um, some of the trends we're seeing, it's, we're in the midst of one of the longest bull runs uh, the U.S. market's seen. Um, many of the Wall Street analysts and economists have been calling for a correction for quite some time. And generally speaking, it's fool's errand to try and call market tops or market bottoms. However, we're going to put ourselves in that basket and in that position and um, we feel the threat of the economic correction, even at a global scale, becomes more and more inevitable as, as the longer that bull market um, runs. Um, the markets are pressured by government policymakers, trade sessions, or even yet unforeseen, unforeseen economic uh, catalysts that could lead to corporate disruptions. Um, the driver, uh, when, when the slowdown starts, TBR expects enterprises will reevaluate all spending to, um, to control costs and to protect, protect their margins. Uh, this will include IT budgets and IT upgrades. Um, that's going to negatively impact what we've come to know as that digital transformation uh, spending and digital transformation engagements. Um, the results are what we'll expect. Uh, the strongest, the best managed IT services vendors and consultancies, they'll capitalize on the opportunity. Um, they'll recruit talent at lower prices. They'll make more aggressive acquisitions of firms that get hit hardest by the economic downturn or they'll just acquire the firms that have already got their eyes on just at, just at a, a more uh, reasonably valued price. Um, and lastly, the, the vendors that have already invested and implemented automation, they're going to benefit um, as they can easily manage their delivery costs in what would be a more cost-sensitive world at that point. And that, that's kind of a, you know, a quick overview of uh, that, that first prediction we see here on uh, slide seven. I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over. Okay. And, and I want to make two points on this one um, because I think it's it's important to understand, as Kevin was saying, we're not predicting a downturn nor are we cheering for it in any way. But if it if it does happen, I think two things to keep in mind. Mind one, the idea of kind of good enough to get by is probably going to become what most enterprises are willing to work with and where they're willing to be when it comes to IT, even as even as 
the consultancies in particular are pressing for innovation and change and digital transformation. I think if there is a slowdown, you're going to see a lot of companies, a lot of enterprises that just say, we're good enough to get by right now. What, what I think is really important are, and Kevin mentioned this, are the, the vendors that are speaking to their clients now about what the scenario would be. What would it be like if there is an economic downturn? What it's, what's it going to do to IT budgets? What's it going to do to your digital transformation? And I think working, working through those scenarios now can reinforce a client's decision to work with a particular vendor. E- even if the downturn doesn't happen, you're still solidifying that, that this vendor, this consultancy is looking ahead and thinking through what the impacts could be and even working with you on how to prepare for that in a, in a budget sense, not only in, a, in an IT sense. Um, so now with that, we'll go to Kelly to talk about a change in consulting in particular. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so the prediction on this side, uh, consultancies will sell more products and emphasize and invest more in um, that side of their business. Um, we were thinking along the lines, um, as we've seen, some of the vendors have been shifting uh, or adding on some software and product capabilities. Um, We expect to see consulting vendors incorporate more of the product and software offerings within their portfolio. Um, The overall trend, um, the vendors have been adding on software and products, but they haven't necessarily shifted their entire business model, um, including sales and delivery operations. To um, They've adapted to support some, but it hasn't been a full-scale transformation. Um, One of the reasons behind this is a lot of the Vendors are uneasy to become a dedicated software vendor and kind of put behind them um, what they've been doing for so long. Um, I wanted to call out a few examples uh, where some of the vendors have been pursuing some of these investments. Uh, The first one, PwC. Um, PwC has extended some of the technology-infused initiatives um, within its existing client base to add on more products, solutions, and platforms within its um, traditional engagements, allowing the firm to become uh, more deeply ingrained within clients' clients operations as well as within those transformation engagements. This is helping them cement their trusted partnerships and kind of accelerate uh, initiatives around IP and solutions-led. Um, internal automation efforts as well are helping PwC as it's pro- building that foundation to um, guide further investments in these capabilities, which is helping them to better address uh, business challenges for clients using these different um, areas of their portfolio. Uh, The second company is BCG. BCG acquired um, a a design consultancy, All of Us, which um, joined their BCG Plantinium subsidiary and helps to build their presence within the UK. The acquisition facilitates BCG's product testing, uh, product design, as well as deployment um, for clients. Uh, With the increased assets, BCG is better suited to pursue um, technology consulting and incorporate these capabilities within within client engagements, particularly around workflow and customer experience. Um, It wasn't the first acquisition along this line either. Um, BCG had also acquired um, Maya Design back in 2017, which um, uh, helped to improve their operations within um, BCG Digital, Digital Ventures and BCG Gamma. The last um, company I want to call out was KPMG. Um, KPMG has a vast, um, a vast portfolio of expertise, um, particularly around business processes, applicable technology, and change management. Um, while they're not necessarily trying to go into the business of creating products. It's using these capabilities to to map out um, complex business processes to drive um, change management as well as increase the use of automation to improve um, or to optimize enterprises as well as um, help improve clients comply with changing regulations. Um, Now looking at some of the drivers behind um, this shift and what is what will help or what um, led into the trend. Um, A lot of the consultancies were looking to keep pace with their IT services vendors. Um, The IT services vendors had a more seamless transition to incorporate the capabilities, so it was a bit more of a natural fit, whereas it's a bit of a different business for a lot of the consultancies. Um, Consulting also also remains um, a more people-driven business, um, so there was a larger change within their um, talent management. Automation also um, 
got rid of a lot of those routine and entry level tasks that shortened the um, overall span of the engagements from discovery to decision as well as from pilot projects to um, actually bringing them to scale. Um, as a result, the vendors that have more aggressively pursued portfolio investments will be better suited to leverage automation, innovation, and solutions. Um, a lot of the firms that have worked through these internal ba battles over engagement structures and the commercial engagements, um, they'll be better suited to address client demand for outcome-based pricing. Um, however, they will face some challenges, um, particularly around talent management. In our webinar, um, I want to say about a month ago, in particular to talent, or particular to ma to management consulting, um, I, we had discussed a bit about how talent management is changing for the consulting vendors. Um, and they have a high number of staff to train and transition into these new areas. Um, the consulting vendors also need to look into different ways of managing the talent as it comes from a different culture and it's different operation-wise, um, which can bring them back a little bit or make it a bit slower to scale some of these technology-driven investments. Um, the businesses could face some short-term stalls from the shift as they bring their people up to scale as well as their delivery and um, facility resources. Um, some may also revert back to just consulting-only models. Um, but for the most part, um, I would say most of the vendors, the the evolution of their models and an emphasis on selling products will result in more muddle through strategies, especially as um, they look to adapt for economic conditions around major change. Um, one vendor that I want to call out in this particular case is IBM. Um, as they've been refining their strategy and approach, um, they have a, law of, a large legacy of selling products as well as increasingly capable consulting capabilities that help it to be more aligned with an IT services vendor as well as a consulting vendor, and which is better suited to address the dynamics of the market in 2020. Um, where IBM is heavy on the tech side as well as the consulting side, they're able to address on both ends. Um, IBM also has a trusted technology brand as well as um, the portfolio breath to build on the tech side a bit stronger than some of the other consulting vendors, but they also do have the advise, build, and run capabilities to um, go play on both ends of the field. I think it's really important when you look at IBM, and I know they had their earnings release yesterday, and so you, there's a lot out um, from TBR right now on those, those initial uh, reports on IBM. I, I think it's important to look at them and, and not think of IBM simply through the lens that we've been looking at them for so long and the challenges that they've had, and instead think about how the market may be changing in ways that simply favor IBM's <laughs> current structure and the strengths they bring. I want to pull on three other threads real quickly before we move on to Boz and the, the death of digital. Um, first, um, Kelly mentioned you know the sort of adjusting the business model. I think PwC, and if you've heard us over the last year, you've heard us talk about the way that PwC as a firm has probably been one of the more successful ones at adjusting their own business model uh, to account for monetizing IP, uh, to account for selling software and providing software as a service in a different way than most consultancies had in the past. Um, and, and I think they probably can serve as a very good lesson for how to do it right for the other consultancies and, and even for the IT services vendors that are still making that adjustment. Um, it, they don't have a muddle through strategy. They have the opposite of that. And I think it's it's important to look at. Um, a second thing is Kelly mentioned scale and the importance that scale will will be in the in the future and for consulting. I mean, it's always important, but I think what we've seen is um, the way that. Emerging technologies like automation, analytics, AI, all of that has have shifted the consulting model away from simply monetizing brains and and marking it by the number of days and a set fee and shifting it to simplicity to speed, and then that last thing that Kelly said scale I think that's really important and then I'm glad she brought up uh, BCG because BCG was one of the most um, Aggressive, aggressive marketers of one of the most the companies that was out there first using the term digital. So they're a perfect example of where we're going to go to next, uh, and that's with Boz as we go to what we're calling well, I'm calling it the death of digital. You yeah. can call it whatever you want, Boz. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll call it digital disappear in our documents. But yeah, certainly uh, it's a good transition from uh, your point of view about 
BCG being one of the first uh, in terms of a marketing digital and labeling digital, and you folks on the line probably most of you aware how a lot of the organizations um, are labeling everything and anything that um, you know can be done or uh, needs to be done with any existing or even new technologies uh, as digital. And uh, there has been quite a bit of a misconception uh, over the last four, five, six years about what this digital means. Uh, how vendors generate revenue, um, you know, who's influencing who essentially in the broader ecosystem start thinking about beyond the IT services, beyond the consulting vendors, looking at the Amazons and Apples of the world and how they actually are thinking about impacting the actually the interaction with the end consumer. So with that, that whole um, uh, spectrum of vendors, that whole uh, really uh, definitions of digital has created a quite a bit of a chaos uh, in the marketplace. In TBR, we have uh, you know looked into how vendors, um, and we continue to look into how vendors generate money through digital transformation initiatives. Which you know we have our own definitions, we have our own view of uh, of uh, services, which still uh, <coughs> largely capture the traditional way of thinking around design, plan, run, uh, cycle, uh, uh, IT advisory, and developing applications, and really. Uh, uh, it's about changing processes and using those services and uh, with, with those new tools that uh, vendors are, doing, uh, are developing. So when we think about digital, when we think about the death of digital, as Patrick pointed it, uh, we started thinking towards the end of uh, 2019 about, you know, it's a new decade, uh, you know, knocking on the door, and start thinking about where cloud was in 2010, how those waves of change uh, impacted, how businesses think about their go-to-market and was digital how digital has impacted uh, their marketing and product positioning and their go to market strategies so we called out uh, you know one of the you know uh, bigger trends that vendors will start dropping digital as a way of marketing their own value proposition as doing something new uh, fair enough we're going to take a little credit here within the first two weeks uh, we saw Accenture dropping Accenture digital as part of their uh, large growth market uh, reorganization uh, and, and making it to uh, you know more of a broader bigger kind of a reorientation towards horizontal capabilities kind of uh, putting up uh, Accenture Interactive on a pedestal and kind of dropping the Accenture Digital as a bigger umbrella because of realization of where actually the new opportunities are coming from within Interactive, within the marketing operations and content development and so on and so forth. Um, we are looking into other vendors that are, um, you know, considering uh, <clears throat> Where, what Accenture uh, just did, but also if you look back broadly in the ecosystem, many of the management consultancies uh, actually, while BCG digital established digital ventures like McKinsey and others, try to put digital as a label to put market portfolios, they never reported revenues from digital uh, services because um, embedding strategy prowess and execution on the back end, it's really about like what they can do best and trying to make a little more of a, a fancier wrapper. So it's, it's about understanding uh, you know, how those uh, companies will continue to generate revenue and how much will they use what they actually do better versus trying to put a, a, a nicer you know, uh, a label on top of it, calling it digital. Uh, a lot of the uh, um, a big part of uh, those changes, and we call it the driver, have been you know, the saturated hype, the the dissolution from cloud uh, that you know a lot of those failed projects are kind of forcing um, you know a lot of those vendors to think different about who they actually have to appeal to because there's also we see a, a generational change and shift to the C-suite uh, in terms of you know folks that actually were maybe in the mid-level management on the on the on the VP now emerging into the C-suite executives those are folks that maybe they grew up with digital technology so I have to think about what's the upcoming generation of buyers that actually you know they uh, for them everything that they do is digital essentially in terms of how and they interact with with employees, how they interact with and customers, because for us that's a, that's a big part of it. It's about changing in the process of interacting internally within the organization as well, external with uh, the buyers. Um, a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, uh, as a result of all these changes, you know, and we think about where where uh, vendors are starting to position about is how, how they how they message it, but they also understand where the buyers are coming from and what buyers are. Um, really thinking about uh, as they think and how they um, 
uh, expand the spend around some of the, uh, you know, the digital transformation programs and they start to mature. Um, buyers typically don't buy a digital transformation program as many uh, vendors may try to label it as such. They think about what else, what are the new uh, entry points, where are the new data points uh, that actually, uh, and what are the connection points between the new data that's coming from all these emerging technologies and how that fits back with uh, the existing uh, IT system. So that's a, that's, a, that's a notion that a lot of the vendors are starting to think about and they start to stitch all these data sources. And uh, you know, we heard earlier from Kevin about possible economic downturn. We heard from Kelly about consultancies uh, changing some of their business models around selling products and such. Uh, whichever scenario we are to occur and face, uh, what some of the lessons that some of the vendors have learned or some of them need to learn is about not trying to sell Standalone products or standalone solutions, but more of an integrated approach to either an AI strategy or more of a, you know, within automation or edge, you name it. No matter what, you need to understand how all these data points connect to the, to the existing ecosystem of, um, because no single uh, enterprise is trying to completely rip and replace the existing IT. They're going through phases, they're going through stages, and vendors need to really be cognizant of those exchanges. The other portion of it, as we think about some of the drivers of the change in the buyer personas that are changing as a result of how vendors interact with, uh, with buyers, is the change within the organization that we've seen a lot from the discussions that Patrick referenced earlier within our Voice of the Customer research. There's a larger change between how digital transformation programs or any kind of a IT modernization programs have started to change. It used to be grassroots initiatives. Now it's all about collaborative initiative and trying to understand who's getting involved and where those buying centers are and who's really the champion of those initiatives. So for vendors need to better grasp and better, you know, if, if, if you're having an IT buyer and he hears digital, the IT buyer has been doing IT, which is all zeros and ones, which is digital for, you know, uh, for the last three, four, five decades, you know. So it, it, it's really, it's really going to be really hard to, to really sell just the digital as it is. You need to be very specific to which processes are you addressing, which processes are you trying to transform, and how that's going to have an impact uh, you know, uh, uh, on the broader uh, outcomes. And that's, that's the other part. You know, we hear about all these emerging technologies. We hear a lot about uh, opportunities they're driving. We see buyers ready to spend more on AI, on analytics. Again, we are you know, seeing a resurgence in spend on analytics tools and services, uh, but vendors need to be careful not to screw up this time around. And essentially, they need to take advantage, but they need to uh, guarantee that they can actually use a cleansed data. And that's, that's the big part of it. I think it's, it, you know, the big data kind of comes back around, but not just having big data for the sake of having big data, but it's about the right data. So that's, that's, you know, vendors need to message that as they try to think about optimizing those processes and not just call digital for the sake of digital because, you know, it's easier to label it, but essentially what actually they're addressing, who the buyers said, a little bit more specific to those uh, buyers' needs. So a lot of moving pieces, uh, you know, it's kind of like a, uh, making a bold statement, digital disappeared, digital is dead, but it's a more about understanding of what digital meant over the last five, six years and what actually how the market is changing uh, for both vendors and buyers buyers and uh, essentially leading the pack from a marketing uh, perspective, uh, you know, certainly uh, would expect some, some others to follow suit. Right. I think it's important to understand we're not saying that the digital transformations are done. We're saying that you don't say we're going to undergo an analog transformation. Yeah. Soon you're just you're not going to say we're going to undergo a digital transformation. You're just going to say a transformation. Two other strands I want to pull on real quick on that. Um, because when we're looking at this, we're very much looking at the impact on the vendors that we cover. So again, the TBR mentality, the the our approach to what to what our approach to research and our approach to analyzing what's happening in the market is to look at the individual vendors. So we always come back to what is this going to mean for each of the individual individual vendors in the market and how are things going to change. And within the document, um, within our predictions document, we we talked at one of the results of this um, end of digital or or death of digital, whatever is going to be, you know. What Boz was alluding to when he talked about how buyers don't buy digital transformation, they buy individual things to get to get certain things. They buy individual services or products um, in order to get a particular outcome. So we could see, you know, in in, in the near term, you know, a, a McKinsey Infosys AWS transformation bundle where partners that you don't think necessarily would partner 
um, are partnering differently. And that's another area we've gone into before and we'll, we'll probably talk about a lot in 2020 is the way that uh, tech companies in particular ch are changing the way they partner. So you could imagine that, a you know, a, again, an Infosys, AWS, and McKinsey digital transformation bundle, although it won't be called digital transformation, will be the will be the way that companies go to market together. Rather than touting their own ability to do digital transformation, they'll tout their ability to be part of a partnership that, that delivers transformation. And and it recalls to, to mind the you know there was an ad a couple of years ago for GE where the the kid was uh, going off to be a software designer or something yeah. uh, at GE, which everybody thinks of as a, as a big engineering company, and the, they made fun of him because he couldn't lift the wrench or something like that. <laughs> and that just it now that was kind of weird at the time, and now it seems kind of quaint, like because every time you turn on the, the TV, there's somebody advertising or the radio about how they provide digital transformation. Well, I think within a year or a little more than that, they're going to stop talking about how they provide digital transformation. Um, Jeez. Got out of GE got out of digital. Digital. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so we have some questions coming in. Um, so we'll tackle those, and please feel free to to send in your questions. Um, we'll keep the line open as long as we have some questions. Um, the first one is, um, what if the markets stay high, no downturn? Where will IT and consulting budgets go? So I guess that's the flip side to our doom and gloom. Is what if things? continue to be good. Who wants to take that one first? I'm looking at Boz and Kevin. Mm. Kevin's going to go first on this? Yeah, I can take a stab at that. Uh, so the question is, is what if what if uh, we don't hit that economic downturn? I think personally it's, 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 uh, it's going to happen. It just depends on when it's going to happen. And I certainly think it may not be this year. It may not be the next few years. But if history teaches us anything, uh, We'll have that 10% correction, and then eventually we'll have uh, we'll, we'll we'll go down even further. But uh, yeah, I think it would be next this 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 upcoming year if things continue just to kind of hum along. It'd be more of a lot of what we've seen in the past. I right. mean, I think uh, companies the the case has already been made that IT spend is, is a smart place to put your money, and I think that money is going to go to you know those. You know the the traditional areas, um, but it will also go more and more of that will go to new, more speculative that that digital project based right. um, spend, and and I think that's where uh, you know some of the companies, the Accentures of the world, will just kind of keep scooping up that 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 newly that newly minted revenue stream. Right, Boz, I know you have some thoughts on this, but I want to weigh in and just say I do think. When it comes to IT budgets, we've been talking about for over a year now the pendulum swing when it comes to who makes the decision yeah. um, and who's in charge of it, who implements, and all that is away from a large, you know, a large group within any one enterprise and more and more back into the IT department where IT budgets are are within the IT shop for a very good reason. So, Boz, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I don't think we'll be any. Um, particular area uh, per se to say, hey, now that we have extra you know, disposable income, let's just dump it on X mm. blank, AI, quantum, edge, you name it, right? But certainly it will uh, increase appetite in any of those areas and start to make uh, buyers a little bit more comfortable with uh, um, you know, transformation uh, processes or any kind of initiatives they have, may have started, such as like SAP S4 HANA implementation or migration and whatnot, and trying to really execute on those um, fundamental and underpinning uh, pieces of the uh, re-architecting the IT uh, for their organizations. That's, that's, that's the key element, I think, is where we may see an increase in spend uh, into more about let's make sure that our IT architecture is ready for the new wave of S4, the new wave of Oracle Autonomous Database of how to work with uh, uh, hybrid IT and, and, and all that, what's coming along. So I think that's where I think it's securing the fundamentals and the foundational uh, IT is, is, is where I may see a little bit more of a, uh, embracing. And I'm making that comment because we also saw as part of the last round the voice of the customer research, we conducted a survey with uh, enterprise buyers across uh, America's EMEA uh, APAC and those buyers are for larger, larger enterprises, uh, and cloud uh, remain on the top uh, of the, the technology that was selected as a key to the digital transformation initiative. Second was analytics, uh, but cloud kind of was like over half, over 60% actually, uh, almost two-thirds of the respondents that we interviewed and we surveyed 
continue to believe cloud is that piece of the puzzle that remains key to their digital transformation initiative and how they actually are moving forward as they think about the next wave of disruptive technologies. Right. That's good. There's some irony there because cloud was supposed to save all this money, and, yep. and in fact, we're going to see more spending on cloud. We've been talking about different pieces of our portfolio, so I wanted to put the slide up here so you could see um, where these predictions are coming from, not only what I mentioned at the beginning, but all the different strands of research. Um, management consulting, which is our, our twice a year broadest, deepest uh, piece of analysis we do here at TBR as a whole. The IT services benchmark comes out every quarter, um, looks at 30 vendors across the entire IT services um, market and what their performance has been and where they're going. Global delivery is focused on 16, 14, 14 IT services vendors and where they have their headcount and the impacts of automation on that. And then the last one is digital transformation insights, and that's a monthly deliverable um, that crosses cuts across everything that TBR does, honestly, but also everything that's happening in digital transformation. So I want to put, there's more questions. I want to put two of them together. Um, and one of those questions is, um, let's see, I saw it and I have it. Okay. Um, so the word, well, and we don't typically get questions directed right at a particular presenter, but we have it this time. So these are both for you, Boz. Um, so the word digital will drop out, mainly because transformation has lar largely been com completed. Um, question mark. And then the other related to that is is who else will be dropping digital in the way that Accenture dropped digital? So I'll give you both those questions and you can run with them. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, starting with, um, you know, the first part of the question, um, the digital uh, digital transformation, I think uh, when we look into the way, the way we look at our research and what, the way, what we hear from the market, from buyers and vendors, um, uh, Certainly moving to the right, if you think about the spectrum of services and areas and phases within the, within the IT transformation, uh, uh, digital transformation, uh, you think about legacy and extension and true transformation phases, right? Um, you know, we've seen uh, the number of enterprise buyers that we interview uh, decreasing within the legacy and substitution phases and then moving more into the to the right, into the extension and into true transformation stages. And that's... Certainly, sound, uh, it's an it's a indicator of where the mindset is, where the budgets are spending, and how uh, buyers are thinking about um, you know, their own uh, organization. Are all these uh, programs completed? No. That would mean that they will seize down IT budget spent, and we see increasing in IT budget spent in a lot of emerging tech like AI and whatnot. So, but what, when we talk about dropping digital out of the equation, is about buyers uh, you know, being fed up with vendors coming to them and calling everything digital and not understanding what they're actually trying to complete because as we referenced earlier, they're not buyers are not buying digital transformation because, you know, digital transformation and as we had it like on the slide if I recall, it was you know the CFO, the five G person the person that installs five G networks, they're not thinking about digital. They don't call their work every day digital. They call it I need to improve that work. work. Yeah. We yeah. don't like to improve that particular process. I need to save money from the CFO and whatnot. I'm not thinking about the digital for the sake of, you know, have a label in front of it. It's about understanding which process and which data is being used to improve those processes. Is it a, my internal department data or it's across department data or it's even across industry data? outside my industry, bringing uh, examples and use cases from outside my industry. And that's really a key element in the of programs are not complete, but more about emphasizing or de-emphasizing de the, the marketing part of digital, but emphasizing the, uh, the working part of digital in terms of like actually the process improvement and, and the, the product side of it. So that's kind of like the, the nuance that we want to uh, highlight and, and uh, hopefully that answers the question about uh, are the programs completed. They're not. They're just changing how buyers are actually thinking about and reacting to spend about those programs. The second part of our recall, the question was, who will be dropping digital? Who will be dropping digital? Good question. Um, well, uh, certainly I think if we look at the broader ecosystem, um, uh, it's about who follows suit usually. And Accenture is a good example to lead the pack. Uh, we have seen in the past in many areas, uh, India-centric vendors, drop, uh, not just drop, follow, follow suit with Accenture, how they acquire companies, how they integrate, 
going back a decade plus, you know, reorienting to some of the industry centric vendors, their own um, go to market into industry vertical PLs. Now, Central Draw changed from industry vertical PL to geocentric uh, organization, as we heard like a couple weeks ago. So, I wouldn't be surprised that to be some of either the first change that we see some of the industry centric vendors, but I would expect uh, if someone would have dropped uh, the word digital out of their reporting. Um, to be some of the India centric pack uh, vendors. From the one that I've currently reporting, uh, I think I'll expect some of those folks uh, will probably drop uh, digital first um, just from their reporting. It still serves them well because this is the nature of the market in which their client base is. So it still serves them well from a marketing perspective, but I think the market will catch up to them pretty soon. Yeah, piggyback on Bonza's thought there. Uh, TCS actually did announce during 4Q19, uh, sometime during the upcoming fiscal year, they're going to reorganize how they report, and they're going to pull digital from their uh, reporting lines, uh, pretty much just saying that everything is increasingly becoming part of just how the deals are won. Um, things may be segmented out more into artificial intelligence, analytics, blockchain, the different pieces that we kind of consider digital, but it's just they're just trying to draw that distinction um, and just uh, kind of highlighted that everything is becoming digital. Um, it's just the integrated part of their projects now. Kelly, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, um, Fujitsu for a while, they were opening digital transformation centers that were branded that way, but they've kind of branched away from that now. It's more focused on more particular technologies like analytics or A&I, and even um, opening like security centers as well. Uh, similarly with HCL, they have been, um, well, digital is underneath their mode one, two, three strategy, and they've kind of, um, been using that as opposed to the particular word digital or even opening uh, or launching products or solutions that are more geared toward um, industries or even any other emerging technologies, but kind of shifting away from the use of digital, not as big as it was before. Yeah, and I think in, in many ways, everything that, that Boz and Kevin and Kelly just pointed out are sort of the the underpinnings of our prediction that, that digital was going to go away is that, you know, and, and Kelly's last point there is, is on Fujitsu is a great example of that. I mean, they moved away from calling them digital transformation centers. That's another one of those planks and sort of the foundation of why we think that prediction is coming true. Um, so we have a few more questions. Uh, this, this next one is fantastic. Um, really, really great question. What will be sacrificed first in the downturn? Multi-cloud, software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure mm -hmm. as a service-based product projects, associated upgrades such as networks. I'm going to go first. Uh, I'm sure you guys all have your thoughts. I think it's the last thing that was, was mentioned in the question, um, associated upgrades such as networks. I think the in a downturn, I don't think 5G is going to be the great accelerant that a lot of uh, a lot of the telecom vendors and a lot of their their consulting partners um, think it's going to be. I, I understand the, all the advantages of 5G. I get that the investments have already been made and some of the infrastructure is being built out. But that next leap where 5G becomes as pervasive and 5G becomes this, this sort of must have as part of your digital transformation that we're not calling digital transformation anymore. I think that in the event of a downturn is the first thing that there's there's nothing more good enough to get by than just sticking with what we have in, yeah. in terms of a network mm -hmm. of 4G. So the the pressure to um to to take advantage of 5G I think is predicated on a healthy economy and a healthy enterprise um and a healthy IT budget and if those three things aren't there, mm, I don't see I don't see that being it. That's my take. Um, who's going next? Boz is going next. I'll go a little bit against that point of view. Uh, and the reason <laughs> I'm staying against this to an extent, uh, the mention around the as a service kind of offerings, infrastructure as a service SaaS. I think uh, we're coming to a point that um, a lot of the, the promises and the expectations of uh, the as a service model to be the kind of a shift from CapEx to OpEx and being really cost advantage, uh, advantage uh, for the enterprise buyers, uh, they come to the realization that cloud or anything as a service is not as cheap. And it, it's really, I think that I think we may actually see um, a shift in buyers' uh, requirements around how actually buyers um, uh, think about cloud and anything as a service because, um, yes, and especially in the economic downturn, if you think about uh, the whole as a service, the perpetual revenue, annuity models, etc., from as a service offerings, uh, adds up, especially with AWS and everybody else kind of and the capacity and every, the, the models that they have created. 
I think what buyers may actually look into, and that may be something that vendors uh, should think about, is buying a infrastructure as a service, but buying software as a license. As an more because essentially, why would you be, uh, you know, thinking about buying those recurring revenues on your SaaS model? Because that adds up pretty quickly. Yes, and when, I mean the the buyers do understand that the, you know, the the capacity and uh, that the stored data and all that cost money to run the infrastructure on a daily basis. But the software, yeah, you may not get all the upgrades uh, as you probably may be accustomed to. But all those upgrades, all due respect to the services vendors and software vendors, they may not be as 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 as, uh, as Perfected as every time they they try to be, and as timely as they try to be, and as if we see version 13.17, that uh, mm-hmm. tells me that the, you know it was rushed, it was not done right. So rather than being you know trying to be sold to the service and say you have that recurring upgrade, I think infrastructure as a service plus software as, as, a, as a license is probably the, uh, the, the way to uh, weather uh, downturn economic. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Third perspective, Kevin? Yeah, I kind of think I'll, I'll take a, the opposing side of the question, not what will be impacted first. I, I think what will be sheltered the most or mm. insulated the most, I think it's going to be the IT with the tangible results, um, what can drive that cost-benefit, um, what you've already invested in, you're going to kind of stick by. I, I think really the core to that is, you know, the, the software layer and anything around that software layer. It's that's the hardest thing to kind of unpeel right. um, and, and kind of start over. Um, you know, I, I think during the downturn, IT refresh cycles um, in general just going to get elongated. Kind of think back to the old HP and Dell days back in the 09 downturn, um, just kind of how they got um, just with those IT refresh cycles getting impacted yeah. so hard. Kind of bring it more rather than the broad corporate view. I mean, I'm just kind of thinking it from a personal view. I wouldn't. But with my own iPhone, I wouldn't down. Right. I wouldn't go to a flip right. phone, but I wouldn't necessarily go get the iPhone 12 whenever it right. comes out. Um, I'm not going to go to Android or Google, right. you know, whatever else. Um, it is kind of the way I would look at it, and I, yeah. I think that's the way IT departments would respond. That's a great way to think about it. No one's going to go back to a flip phone in a in a re- in a recession or a downturn, but they aren't going to they aren't going to get the new one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Anything else, Kelly? You want to weigh in on this? Um, yeah, I would agree that it's probably the um, the networks that the companies would probably Thanks. let go of. Um, looking at like um, Cisco, for example, um, it's not. As they shift into other areas, it's probably not something that they would seek out as an engagement anyways, and I don't think clients would really be looking to change their networks. Um, On the flip side, kind of, I would see multi-cloud as kind of an opportunity, as I know a lot of the vendors have been um, gearing a lot of their investments towards multi-cloud, like um, HCL, for example, not to keep harping on them, but um, they launched a Google Cloud business unit um, not too long ago, I think it was in December or November, um, to kind of create new opportunities in that area. And then over the past few days, they announced a similar initiative with Microsoft. So I think that's kind of an area that they're shifting and hoping to generate traction with. That's a really important point because the question sort of um, implies or takes as a granted that the clients are going to be, you know, the sole people deciding what gets sacrificed. The so many of the vendors we cover have invested so much in multi-cloud capabilities. Those They're not going to give up on those investments. So their ability to push multi-cloud as an offering, um, no matter what happens, I think is really important. All right, so we have a few more questions. Um, we have, uh, well, we I think we can do th- this one real quick, because it's a, it's a question I think makes sense based on what we've been saying, um, and I think we need to be really clear about it. Again, it's for Boz. Are you suggesting just digital going away or transformation too? Some use both. Some use just transform. It's true, but oh, go ahead. Talk. Yeah, I think uh, it's just the digital part. I yeah. think it's that that labeling of uh, all technologies. Uh, transformation. I think I think it's that we kind of uh, talked earlier about is uh, it's really important piece because there are phases of making changes around processes, and no one transforms overnight. But certainly, all the changes that are made through either through a substitution cycle or extension cycle within IT architecture or business processes using technologies that are more sophisticated than previously set up will lead to a, a transformation of how an organization will conduct their business. How are we going to drive insights as a result of 
embedding and utilizing all these technologies within their processes. So transform the transformation piece, that's the end goal, and that's not going to go away. I think it's how the technologies have been used and the entire wrapper around the whole process change has been um, over-marketed. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, and I think, too, like, we're talking about transformation. Um, I'm sure in a couple of years there's going to be some other buzzword that everybody's using, like reinvention or renaissance. I think about, like, uh, Disney, how they have their Imagineers. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what we're heading yeah. towards. We're heading towards a new kind of description for digital transformation. Somebody's going to come up with the phrase that captures that that everybody is going to latch on to. Um, so another question here, um, where'd it go? There we go. Uh, do buyers have a preference for McKinsey, Infosys, AWS, that sort of bundle, um, versus an Accenture and AWS? And would AWS, Azure offer their own services? Um, <clears throat> now, another really good yeah. question. Um, the answer to the last part is yes. Uh, the challenge there, and that's where we talk a lot to IT services vendors, um, about doing consulting is the challenge is it's a different business model and services looks easier. Consulting looks far easier than it actually is. It's a very hard business to run. Services is actually a harder business to run than it looks like when you're coming from the outside. So I think yes, the answer is yes, AWS and Azure are certainly going to offer services. I think everything they're going to offer in terms of services are going to be very close to what they already do. Um, in the same way that you think of like the telecom vendors offer services, but they're really all about all about the carriers and they're all about telecoms. Um, now, the first part of that, do buyers have a preference? Boz, do we see anything in the – I know we came up with this sort of Infosys, McKinsey, AWS bundle as a way of thinking about how do you cover the entire spectrum. Um, and arguably, Accenture, AWS would also cover the entire spectrum. Um, I, I'll, I guess I'll let you go first, and then I'll go. <laughs> yeah, wait, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I, I think for what we have heard from buyers, actually, uh, on services um, is that they don't – anticipate um, and don't think about putting their eggs in one basket with one single vendor uh, when it comes to um, transforming the organization through IT. Um, it's about, you know, it's kind of de-risking the whole situation. They prefer vendors to stay within swim lane. They prefer vendors also to pass the baton of each other smoothly. And that's easier said than done, but I think it's about as long as the vendors can ensure that data is properly managed, cleansed, and really passed along between all parties is certainly, um, you know, it's, it's, that, that's, what, that's what buyers are looking for. Do they like to, to, to spend, I mean, if you think about, I mean, you know, to spend all the money for McKinsey, nine out of 10, nine out of 10 probably IT buyers, probably not. But when the C-suite comes on board, they want to have to buy themselves the securing the trust, bring right. McKinsey on board. And then IT buyers are saying, well, we need to make sure we have the infrastructure as well, we need to have the managed services from the scale perspective with the emphasis and whatnot. So it's that, and going back to the earlier comments about who uh, can ensure the scale, who can ensure that, you know, um, uh, data interoperability between all parties and how they're de risking uh, the spend. Can Accenture cover what, uh, you know, emphasis and McKinsey do? To some degree, yes, but there's certain buyers that they'll take McKinsey versus Accenture in certain elements, and depending who you're talking to, especially if it's, you know, more IT-led organization or more a C-suite kind of a driven uh, spend. So that, that is more about who can guarantee, who can present a better data quality, uh, and who can actually uh, um, execute on that. I think to the, I want to kind of make a comment on the second part about AWS and Azure, something that we actually heard from some buyers in the recent interviews is about actually AWS came up more often than not uh, and as a vendor of choice for digital transformation services. Uh, and um, the, one of the reasons they pointed to uh, AWS was that they're able to, they're the one hosting the data, they're the one that actually managing the data, they're able to clean the data as well. So buyers decide to think about how many actually hands are also uh, touching the data. So that's why it's important if there's a three-way partnership or four-way partnership or two-way partnership, that back and forth between parties is very clean because AWS can certainly do it all on their own and because they've experimented and they try some of those data um, activities around wrangling, cleansing, managing within their own organization and now they're offering those services to, uh, to third parties. Now, not every buyer would think about AWS about 
process transformation when it comes to the actual change management, when it comes to culture, when it comes to think about what's possible. They would think they look at AWS more like the transaction piece of the data, which is a, certainly a big piece of the, of the puzzle. But I would not discount uh, those uh, AWS and, uh, and Azure-like uh, vendors um, uh, to go a little bit more aggressively uh, or at least be selected by buyers a little bit more often than, than in the previously just because of the nature of their holistic approach to uh, data. And I think, so, two things. When you take what Boz was saying about how the people that we surveyed and the people we talked to for the Digital Transformation Insights um, Voice of the Customer Research talked about preferring AWS because they're close to the data. <clears throat> when you think about that and then you think about the last few years where everyone in the IT services space has been hammered, everybody in Enterprise has been hammered with this idea that data is the new oil, data is this, data is it's the most important thing is the data. Well, if you keep hearing the message that the most important thing is the data, when it comes time to make a big change, you're going to trust the people that you think are closest to the data and better best understand yeah. it. So that makes sense. Um, and then I think the second thing is that we're – we are seeing and hearing how much more clients are willing to evaluate their vendors' abilities to partner. So it's not it's no longer the one throat to choke, it's the how well are you partnered with who what are your relationships with um the various vendors that I know I'm gonna have to have in order to undergo this big transformation. And again, it's the kind of thing that makes sense. Everyone now appreciates that nobody is end to end. So if no one is end to end, then you need to look at your different um, technology providers and you look at your consultancies and you look at your IT services vendors and you say, okay, who is best at partnering and how can you prove it? How can you actually show that your relationship with SAP is better than Deloitte's relationship with SAP? And so I think that that kind of um, distinction, that kind of differentiation is going to be more important going forward. So in, in some ways, the answer to the question is, you know, do buyers have a preference? That Buyers have a preference for who is closest to the data and who partners best. Yeah, one thing that kind of, kind of uh, just uh, the light bulb went in my head about some of the findings from the research we just did in the last, before the end of the last year um, about uh, vendor relationship and as an attribute to uh, vendor selection. Certainly an important piece, but uh, not as critical attribute for vendor selection, having an existing relationship, which suggests that the buyers are certainly open for uh, changing <laughs> their, their, their vendors and certainly looking into uh, options either through a, a multi uh, party alliance uh, consortiums or anyone that can really do well with, uh, you know, and understand their, uh, their data better. So uh, existing relationships are important, but not a critical for vendor selection. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, that wraps up the questions. We'll turn it back over to Sarah. All right, thanks, Patrick. Um, all right, everyone, please feel free to reach out to the team with any follow-up questions you may have. Um, if you have a few moments, it would be greatly appreciated if you could fill out the survey on your screen. A replay version of the webcast will be available after the event and will be sent out to you via email. For your list of our upcoming and past webinars, please visit tbri.com. Be sure to join us on Wednesday, February 5th for IoT Settled In for the Long Haul. Thank you and have a great day.